Alrighty, so our theme this semester has been Think Theism, subtitle, Natural Theology and the Truth of Christianity. Um, these are brought to you by Rosho Christi, but disclaimer, the stuff that we talk about here is not necessarily endorsed by Rosho Christi National, nor by our host church, uh, uh, which is Central Church. Um, so if I say something that seems a little awkward or weird, uh, that's either I'm quoting somebody, it's my own personal weird belief, it is not necessarily endorsed by Central or Rosho Christi. So with that, who am I? Um, there was a question about this uh, last week. Um, so I'd like to just put my cards on the table here. My name is Zachary. I'm a biomedical engineering graduate student. I am an evangelical Protestant, and yes, I do believe the Bible. Um, now, we're going to talk a lot about science today. Uh, so I also think it's important to mention that for a lot of Christians, there's kind of a question about, is the earth a few thousand years old, or is it billions of years old? Uh, I'm staunchly in the billions of years old uh, camp. But if you are in the thousands of year old uh, camp, I don't want you to be like scared of what I'm about to say. All right. So just transparency for everybody for that. Um, so what we're talking about broadly this semester is this question. We have our dialogue uh, set up here between a hypothetical atheist named Alvin, a hypothetical Christian named Carol. And Alvin's asking this question, why should I think any of what you're saying is true? And Carol is uh, in virtue of 1 Peter 3.15, obligated to give a response. So there are a lot of different ways that Carol could answer this question, and the way that we're going to be discussing this semester is following this uh, little pyramid, which is um, starting off by giving arguments for the existence of God from natural theology. So these are things independent of the Bible. Why I think a God of any sort exists? Then, um, secondly, we'll follow that up with responses to atheological arguments. For example, like, if God exists, then why is there evil in the world? That seems to be evidence against God. Um, and once you have uh, advanced arguments for the existence of a God and responded to arguments against the existence of a God, then the question is, well, if you're successful in that, now the question is, what type of a God is this, or who is this? Um, and that's where you cap it off with historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. So if you have the existence of God and the resurrection of Jesus, you have a very strong foundation for uh, the claims of Christianity. So what we're doing today, you may have seen this before, uh, this is another way of kind of grouping categories. Uh, we're firmly in this category of general theism and making a positive argument. So if this argument that we talk about today is successful, the conclusion is going to be that there is um, a divine creator of the universe. It doesn't tell you that this divine creator is the God of the Bible, it just tells you that there is a divine creator. Some people uh, get upset because that they want the big conclusion, but the, the argument is way more reserved uh, than that. So here's the uh, topic. So is the fine-tuning of the universe evidence for design? Subtitle, teleological arguments uh, for the existence of God. So here's our roadmap for today. So first we'll talk about a really like blinding fast introduction to design arguments, how they work in general uh, and, and a ludicrously short history. Then we'll talk about specifically the fine tuning version of this argument, and then we'll open it up to discussion. And I have a couple of objections uh, prepared, but um, we'll kind of evaluate, is this actually a good argument, All right? So let's start with an introduction to uh, these design arguments. I should also mention that uh, if at any point you uh, want to stop and ask a question or make a comment, please, uh, please do so. Okay, so what are design arguments? Uh, this leads to the first resource, which is this book um, right here called God and Design, The Teleological Argument and Modern Science. Excellent book if you're interested in design arguments in general. It contains uh, a collection of essays from scientists, philosophers, and uh, theologians all across the board. Some of them support uh, the fine-tuning arguments, some of them are against the fine-tuning arguments, uh, some of them are not really sure, um, but it's a really good balanced book, and I highly recommend that. So let's do a warm-up here and talk about a design inference just in general. So let me give you a hypothetical scenario, all right? Suppose that you come across a man named Craig, and he is a dead body. He has two millimeter, or two nine-millimeter bullets in his back, and a 9mm pistol has been discovered near the crime scene. This 9mm pistol is missing two bullets. It has all the indications of being recently fired. The fingerprints on the gun match uh, that of a man named Jones. So what does this mean? Let's just think about it for a second. Yes, go ahead. Logically, Jones killed Craig. Why? Because his fingerprints are on the gun, 
it could not have been correct because it shows two uh, bullet shots. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm kind of, I, I was at a specific reason. Right. Yeah, so, so this is like a very dream scenario for a cop, right? So there's a lot, I've only given you about three or four facts here, but you've done a lot of piecing together of those facts. For example, bullets in his back. Well, what's the probability that someone could shoot themselves in the back twice? It's really, really low. Um, what is the probability that uh, Jones's fingerprints would be on the gun if he didn't uh, uh, pull the trigger? So. What's going on here is you have a collection of unique facts, so bullets, fingerprints, things like that, certain things about the world. You have an epistemic framework, which if you're not familiar with that term, uh, epistemology is just knowledge. It's how you relate facts to other propositions, which then leads to a design inference, or more accurately, an intentionality inference. This is not a chance occurrence. Jones intentionally killed Craig. Now, the question here, now everyone's probably familiar with the unique facts, but the epistemic framework here is kind of the vague part because you were able to piece together those facts really quickly, but you may not be obvious, er, you may not even be aware of how those facts are related to each other, but you know that they are. This is actually kind of the bane of design arguments. So for the history, for a long, uh, for the history of the design argument, people often will present the facts and say this is attributable to divine design, but not really formally relate those facts to the inference. So we'll, that's going to be a kind of a recurring theme. So the basic structure is just that. You have unique features of our universe, you have a specific epistemic framework, and those, uh, that leads to the inference that uh, the features are attributable to design. Uh, there are a very long history. The design argument goes back at least to Aristotle. I just have up here a couple of random examples, um, all the way up to uh, uh, Aquinas and uh, Turretin excuse me, from, you know, about 1680. Uh, this is, I like Turretin's quote. He says here, the wonderful beauty and order of the universe is another proof for the existence of God. There's so suitable a disposition of parts, so constant a concord of things, so discordant. You may say these things were arranged by chance, but I don't know if such an impious and absurd opinion is worthy of refutation. And I like this because he's like, I'm not going to tell you what my epistemic framework is. I'm just going to tell you that your idea is wrong. Um, and it, you're impious for thinking that. So anyway, uh, the most famous example is probably Paley's Watchmaker, and I'm sure most of you have probably heard this before. Uh, so William Paley was a, a priest from uh, the late 1700s, uh, and at, towards the end of his career, he wrote uh, his magnum opus, which is uh, the natural theology. Um, and in there, he considers an argument for the existence of God based on design. Here, here's a story for you. Suppose I'm walking around in a field and I come across a rock that's in the middle of that field. I'm not going to think anything about it. But suppose I keep walk walking and happen upon a pocket watch on the ground. And not only does it have an intentional purpose to it, telling time, but the mechanism by which it tells time is a very delicate system. It's all these intricate gears that are all interwoven together so that if any one of them was off by just a little bit, the purpose of the watch would no longer be fulfilled. And then he goes on to say, Every indicator or of contrivance and every manifestation of design which exists in such a pocket watch exists in the works of nature. So he's arguing by analogy that just as you are warranted in believing that the pocket watch had a designer, you should think that the universe has a designer. And some of the examples he gives are from biology, so the eyeball, for example. So we can structure Paley's argument like this. The unique features of the universe he pointed to were biological parts ordered to a purpose, eyeballs, for example. And the epistemic framework he was using was an analogical relationship, just as you know, pocket watches are to designers, likewise biology is to uh, the same way, which leads to the design inference. Now, the first attack was by a guy named David Hume. He actually predated Paley just historically, but logically it's irrelevant for this. He said, this analogy is incredibly weak. Um, whenever you look at a pocket watch or something like even a house, we know how these things were built. Like we've seen pocket watches being built. We've seen houses being built. And houses, for example, are not assembled by a single person. There may be like one uh, draftsman, but there are hundreds of builders that are involved. So what is it exactly about the universe that makes us, or biology, that makes us think there was a single designer? And what is it that even thinks that there's an analogy at all? So he says this analogical relationship is questionable at best. Now. Darwin is probably the more famous one. 
uh, who uh, came along and offered an alternative to Paley's design inference and says, actually, we don't need to appeal to design to explain these biological parts. Um, if we just have my theory of evolution, which is that you have these creatures that have random biological variations within them, combined with a selection effect of nature, you can get some really complex features. Um, so in the case of an eyeball, you just need to get the ball rolling in a particular direction. So if you have one creature that has like a photoreceptive cell on its head, um, then you have a wide variation of uh, photoreceptivity. The ones that see the best are going to live and they're gonna propagate. And so then the next generation, uh, the ones that see better than the others will propagate and the ones that see better than them. And eventually over a really long period of time, you can get these complex structures. And so with the biological uh, alternative of Darwin and the um, epistemological challenges of Hume, the design inference kind of fell out of favor. Um, now, there were some developments in the 20th century that really changed the fortunes of the design argument. Uh, the first one, this is a very technical note that we'll get to, it'll be relevant later, but don't get too bogged down by it. Probability theory was developed, it started by a guy named Thomas Bayes, I think in the 1800s, but the exact relationship between facts, evidence, theories, propositions, et cetera, didn't really come into its own until the 1950s. The second thing is that evolutionary biology uh, began to reveal structural and procedural complexity that severely challenged uh, particularly the gradualist tenet of Darwinism. Now this is something we talked about last semester uh, quite a bit when we talked about like the extended synthesis and certain things about how uh, um, some, some of the tenets of the old school version of Darwinism probably aren't gonna hold up. Um, and so some people have kind of turned that into a design argument. Uh, we're not gonna talk too much about this uh, tonight though. Um, so the third point that's that is relevant is uh, cosmology comes into its own as a field. Because uh, if what with uh, Einstein in the 1910s and whatnot in the development of general relativity, uh, the um, development of the Big Bang Theory, all of those things became uh, formalized in the, uh, in the 20th century. And in particular, whenever these models were finalized and developed, a lot of very interesting coincidences showed up. Um, and it turns out that whatever you think about evolution, like put that off to a shelf, on, on, on a shelf for a minute, the universe that we inhabit is, is uh, it's actually really fine-tuned, which means to say if there were certain conditions that were different in the early, early, early conditions of the Big Bang, then we don't get things like planets. So evolution is pretty powerful, but it, does, it can't even get started if there's not even a planet, or if there's not even chemistry, or if there aren't even elements. Um, and so this became called like uh, wider teleology, which is to say, you know, step away from eyeballs for a minute, let's just look at carbon, what's necessary for carbon to exist. Um, and the big book on that was uh, actually this one down here, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, uh, which was written in 1986. That was like the landmark work uh, for that. So um, let's talk about this wider teleology point and see uh, what the fine-tuning argument is in detail. So what is the fine-tuning argument? This leads to resource number two, which is A Fortunate Universe uh, by Grant Lewis and Luke Barnes. Uh, this book is probably the single best book as far as summarizing both the scientific data in an accessible way as well as some of the leading interpretations. Relevantly, Grant Lewis is actually an atheist and Luke Barnes is a Christian. So this book is written, uh, it's co-written by these two guys, which tells you that there's not really like a religious uh, uh, agenda in it. They're just interested in the physics. So let's define this fine tuning. So I kind of mentioned wider teleology and stuff like that. Um, here's a nice kind of vague definition for you. It looks as if small changes in the universe's basic features would have made life's evolution impossible. Now, despite the metaphor, I think the, the most important thing about the definition is that fine tuning is not design. That would be a circular argument. This is not the design argument from design, it's the design argument from fine tuning. Um, so the, uh, perhaps a better way to put it would just be to say that fine tuning is delicate. The our universe is delicate for the existence of life. And you can have things that are delicate and designed, things that are delicate and not designed, right? So um, the general structure of the argument goes something like this. First, we start with the fact of life. Our universe allows for the existence of conscious embodied moral agents. So it's not just like self-replicating bacteria, but life such as ourselves is very interesting. 
Second uh, is the fact of fine tuning. The conditions under which a universe can permit life of any kind, and especially life that, that's unique like ours, it, uh, are exquisitely fine tuned. Third is the step of an explanation. So this fine tuning discovery needs uh, some type of an explanation. It's not just out there. It's, it's got to need some type of an explanation. And lastly, the argument part is that God is, is uh, the best explanation. Okay? So that's the general structure. But let's turn this into a formal argument. All right? So I'll show you the beginner's version and the advanced version. Okay? So beginner's version. This is by a fellow named William Lane Craig. Uh, this is called the chance elimination formulation. It goes like this. There are three options available for explaining fine-tuning. First, physical necessity. The universe is fine-tuned because it had to be. Uh, it's no more surprising than the fact that the circumference of uh, a circle is proportional to its diameter. They're interrelated to each other. So likewise, things are the way they are because they have to be. Secondly, the second option is chance. We got lucky. That's it. And then the last one is design. So, premise two, fine-tuning is not due to physical necessity. Premise three, fine-tuning is not due to chance. Conclusion, therefore, it's due to design. Yeah, it's, it's a formal argument, but if you're not persuaded, I don't blame you. It seems suspicious, right? It seems too easy. Um, but the structure, the, the structure is sound. Now, you need some sub-arguments to justify each one of those. But the whole point of this is that it's not an argument for design, it's an argument against chance and against physical necessity, so design falls out uh, in virtue of that. So that's one version, logically valid, not super persuasive. So here's the advanced version. This is from uh, Luke Barnes, and uh, he leverages the uh, Bayesian theory testing that we talked about from earlier, okay? So this involves some math, all right. So for two theories, I'll read it to you, but trust me, we'll, we'll only come back to this when we need to. I'll keep the math as little as possible. So for two theories, T1 and T2, in the context of the relevant background information B, if it is true of some piece of evidence E that the probability of that evidence given theory one on the background information is substantially greater than the probability of that evidence given theory two and the same background information, then that evidence strongly favors theory one over theory two. Good? Okay. What does that mean? <laughs> what does this mean? So what, what this is saying, so let's go back to our, let's go back to our gun example to, to show this, all right? So um, theory one and theory two are explanations of some phenomenon, and evidence is going to be the phenomenon in question. The background information is going to be everything that is relevant that we know about the situation. Let's consider that Craig has been discovered with two bullets in his back. Theory one is he committed suicide. Theory two is somebody else killed him. So what is the probability that Craig has two bullets in his back given uh, the theory he committed suicide and uh, the theory or, and all of the background information we know? It's, it's highly unlikely, right. Because um, in that background information, we include things such as if he shoots himself in the back, he's not gonna be able to shoot himself again. Right? Uh, it's also going to include, it's hard to reach around behind uh, uh, your back. For example. Yeah, things like that. But the theory that somebody else shot him is substantially more likely than that. So the evidence of bullets being in his back, E, is substantially more probable given somebody else killed him. Yes? Let's say Craig, we, we know that Craig has medically limited flexibility and absolutely cannot touch or reach around his back. Mm -hmm. Would that go into background information? Yes, that would evidence? go in the back, yeah, exactly. The, the background information, yep. Okay. Yeah, okay. So that's, this is, this is totally non-controversial. This is just a statement of Bayesian theory testing, all right? So the second part of the argument is that the likelihood that we have a life-permitting universe, that's our evidence, the universe is life-permitting, the likelihood of that given the background information and naturalism is vanishingly small. In other words, the probability of a life-permitting universe, given God does not exist, given there's no weird spooky principle out there that all, all that exists is just matter and energy, the uh, likelihood that our universe is life-permitting is very small. The third part is that given theism, a life-permitting universe is not very small. Therefore, the existence of a life-permitting universe is evidentially 
uh, evidentially favors theism over naturalism. All right? Now, don't get too bogged down in this. If you're not catching this like immediately, that, that's okay. Like this, this might take a minute. Yeah, go ahead. So it's saying that like under the assumption that the world is fully godless and natural, that mm -hmm. it's unlikely that we would have life. If we run into the system that there is a god, life is more likely. Yeah, it's exactly. It's not saying that it's more likely to have a god. It's saying if there is a god, we're more likely to have life. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so the, the question here is, are these justified? Now, the whole point of this is not, I, I, again, I don't want you to get too bogged down on this. The whole point of this is just to say that in the general framework of life, tuning, explanation, God, this is a formal version. And that's relevant if you want to get uh, really rigorous with it. Um, so I only bring this up so that you're exposed to it um, and so that at relevant points we can refer to it. But for most of this argument, we're actually just going to use the uh, simple version right here. Okay? Here, I'll, I'll leave that back up. If you, want, if you want to read this in more detail, that citation down there is A Reasonable Little Question by Luke Barnes. Uh, it's a paper he wrote last year. Um, it's available for free um, if you want to read it. So um, that's where I'm getting this version from. So the, the, the question here, the fine-tuning question is, is premise two justified? That's like the real hard bit. Um, and then the second part is if um, theism makes the fine-tuning more likely, okay? Um, but just keep that in the back of your head. So we'll go with the more like straightforward four-point version here, all right? So let's start with life. Does life exist? Yeah, pretty uncontroversial. So what exactly is this evidence of fine-tuning? Now, there are probably a hundred cases that have been discussed, all of them with varying degrees of, uh, I don't know, understandability, comprehensibility, et cetera. These are three cases that are, uh, first of all, they are easily quantified. They're rigorously quantified. Um, they are roughly easy to understand, um, and they're not controversial. Um, and that would be the fine-tuning of the cosmological constant, uh, the Higgs vacuum expectation value, and the Yukawa coupling uh, energy. Now, for the purposes of today, I'm only going to talk about one and mention the second two in passing. All right. So the cosmological constant is probably uh, the single most discussed problem uh, in the fine-tuning literature. Here's a nice summary by Martin Rees, which this is also a really good book. It's a little outdated, though, but it's, I, I still like it. Um, so he says here, measuring the cosmological constant, lambda, was the biggest scientific news of 1998. An unsuspected new force, a cosmic anti-gravity, controls the expansion of our universe, even though it has no discernible effect on scales less than a billion light years. Fortunately for us, and very surprisingly to theorists, lambda is very small. Otherwise, its effect would have stopped galaxies and stars from forming, and cosmic evolution would have been stifled before it could even begin. So what does he mean by this? So very super like really brief description of the Big Bang. All the matter in, all the matter, energy, everything in the universe uh, was condensed into an infinitesimal point known as a singularity. At some point that very rapidly expanded into everything that uh, we see today. That also includes uh, the vacuum, that includes matter, dark energy, all of it. Now the rate of that expansion is um, in part governed by the cosmological constant. Um, and if the expansion goes too quickly, then what happens is uh, the matter, the normal matter that we see around us, doesn't have time to congeal into anything interesting. Um, the Big Bang resulted in predominantly hydrogen everywhere and a little bit of helium. So what this is saying here is that um, in that rapid expansion, you start off predominantly with hydrogen, which is just you know single protons, um, but at small scales, eventually those protons are able to congeal together because of gravity, they start compressing in on each other, you start getting stars, and you start getting nuclear fission, you start getting uh, dust clouds, and start getting interesting things. Um, but if the universe expands too quickly, then there's not enough time for, and uh, those particles don't get close enough together to congeal into anything interesting. It just becomes hydrogen, as far as I would say the eye can see, but there are no eyes. There's just hydrogen everywhere. Conversely, if it's too slow, then, uh, and it doesn't expand rapidly enough, then that uh, um, the gravitational pull of all the particles and whatnot actually has a reverse effect, and it crunches back in on itself. So you don't get anything interesting there. You just go back into a black hole. So there's this very narrow range where 
the universe expands and it congeals into something interesting. So that's like a very general overview. Here's the math in case you're interested. This is the Einstein field equation. Uh, this is where the cosmological constant comes from. Truth in advertising, what we're really talking about when we talk about the cosmological constant is not the cosmological constant uh, because this is actually not a real number, it's a fake number. What we're really talking about is the effective cosmological constant, um, which is a combination of, the, of numerous fields in uh, particle physics uh, that combine together and produce what's known as the energy density of the vacuum. I know I'm moving very quickly here. Yes, Sam? Uh, I have an exam uh -huh. next week. Could you uh, explain tensors? Tensors. They're, they're matrices. How about that? I'll say that to bother Andrew. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> So, okay, all this to say, the effective cosmological constant is a measure of the energy density of the vacuum, okay? That's really all you gotta, gotta know for this. Um, so how is this rigorously calculated? So one thing that, and, and, um, that is very important when it comes to fine tuning cases is the question of normalizability. So if you have this number that's really small, but you don't have any comparison range to it, then there's nothing to tell you if it's actually small or actually big. Let me ask you a question. Is one foot very big? Exactly. Is it a one foot tall person? That's weird and super freaky. Is it a one foot tall tumor in your stomach? Oh, well, that's horrible. It depends on the scale. So if I tell you, for example, that the cosmological constant is uh, effectively like 200 and something uh, uh, electron volts, I don't remember what the exact value is, is that big or small? Yeah. It's very small because electrons are very small. Yeah, exactly. So, so what's big and what's small? So what we can talk about here is we can set some bounds to what's possible for this type of a value. Um, what's helpful for the effective cosmological constant is that it has dimensions to it. Namely, it's, it's a measure of energy. So uh, in theoretical physics, the boundary point for the, most of the laws, and in particular the standard model, is what's called the Planck mass. So the Planck mass is essentially the uh, largest mass something can be before it's col it collapses in on itself and becomes a black hole. So we can normalize relative to the Planck mass, all right? Um, which means that we can actually get a physically meaningful range for this value. So the question is, given that, and given our boundaries of the Planck mass, then um, what, like how, how narrow is this life permitting range for the cosmological constant? So um, if you normalize that, so uh, what I have here is rho sub lambda this, uh, divided by rho sub Planck. So that just means the, dens the effective density of, or sorry, what, what am I trying to say? The effective density of the vacuum, I think, energy density of the vacuum relative to another density value determined by the Planck mass, if you normalize that and it's less than uh, minus 10 to the negative 90, which is a really, really, really small ratio, then the universe would recollapse after a single second. That's where that recollapsing comes in. So if it's negative, uh, if that ratio is negative and it's negative by uh, one part in 10 to the negative 90, then, um, or I guess one part in 10 to the 90, the universe collapses in on itself. And it's wonderfully symmetric because if it's greater than uh, positive 10 to the negative 90, then it goes too fast and structural formation stops after a single second. So we can get a nice normal distribution um, or sorry, uniform distribution, not normal distribution, a uniform distribution between the uh, negative Planck mass to the positive Planck mass, and we get a nice range of 10 to the negative 90. So that's where that comes from. Now, if you wanna see the math, I have the citation right here. Uh, it's from Adams et al. in 2017. The title is Constants on, or sorry, Constraints on Vacuum Energy from Structure Formation and Nucleosynthesis, all right? So if you're interested in looking at all the math and where that comes from, that's where that comes from. I would recommend you do that. I am an engineer in biomedical engineering. I still don't fully understand what's going on here. I understand if Big Bang go fast, bad. If Big Bang go slow, bad. Big Bang just right. That's what I understand. So comments or questions? Yes. If somebody were to try and deal with this problem, then they might try and ship away at the range mm -hmm. negative Planck density and positive Planck density? Am I trying to shrink that down? Yeah, it, can it be narrowed? Um, there are different numbers I've seen for this. The smallest number is, um, or I guess actually the biggest number, the, the most coarse 
tuning that's available for this number is 10 to the 53, which is still really big. For those of you that are not familiar with exponentials, when we say 10 to the negative 90, we mean uh, 0, 0. 0.000000, 90 zeros, and then 1. That's, what, that's the number that's in view here. So it's really, really small. Um, now, you can do 10 to the 53, which is 53 zeros, and then 1. Uh, but that's still pretty, that's pretty small. Um, I actually have a bit of a question or comment on this. Yeah. So I recognize that it's giving a range and that the, the specific range that it's giving is a very small, like a very tiny range. Yeah. But I don't see how that means that, I don't see how that gives a likelihood that it will fall within that range. Because, for instance, if, ah, that, yeah. if that range is like, Point, well, well, I'm just going to use bigger numbers. So how do we, how do you point know one to point five. Is uniform. If the whole, mm. yeah, like for instance, well, specifically, if the numbers are like point one to point five, right? Then, if the only numbers that you have access to are numbers that are between point one and point five, then it falls yeah. within the range of those that doesn't. I, the fact that it's only point one to point five doesn't matter too much. Yeah, like what would be like the so, theoretically smallest or largest number the Planck's constant could be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so the, the, uh, the theoretically largest number, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to relate that, but it would essentially be that the ratio, um, in, in this case, uh, since they're ratios, it's going from negative 1 to positive 1. Um, so that's your normal range. Because what it's saying is that the, since the Planck value is the largest physically knowable value, uh, as far as the laws of our universe are concerned, then uh, you can't go past that, which means that the biggest number that you could take on for this uh, vacuum energy density is going to be uh, rho sub Planck. And rho sub Planck divided by rho sub Planck would be 1. So in this case, it's normalized in uh, negative 1 to, 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 to positive 1 there. Um, Maybe they should have considered this zero to 2. Zero? What? A, a scale they, they could have just thought about it. I, I, I have prefer that. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Um, let's see, what do I have here? Oh, so why I think it's a real problem, I think was the, uh, the question. Why, why I think that this is the case? So um, this is actually a really good question. So the, um, the book here, the Fortunate Universe uh, book, lists reasons why the cosmological constant is such a tough uh, nut to crack. Um, and it, the term they use is a fine-tuning perfect storm. And the reason for this, first, is that it's not a single problem. It's actually multiple problems. You have numerous fields that are all independently contributing to the vacuum energy density. Um, and there's nothing constraining, there's, there's no known physical restriction on how much energy can be contributed from any of these fields. Uh, and then the second point is that general relativity doesn't give any bounds to this either. Uh, general relativity is completely consistent with any number uh, assumed uh, by lambda. Originally it wasn't, interestingly, but uh, it turns out it doesn't actually restrict it in any way. Uh, particle physics also doesn't really contribute to this in either. Um, and quantum gravity doesn't really help because the problem goes beyond the smallest scale, the Planck scale, which is the, the smallest scale. Planck is essentially a term used for the extremes, the smallest scale, largest mass, et cetera. Um, alternative forms of dark matter and dark energy also don't assist with this either because they all have the same problem of why do they contribute in various levels. Um, the sixth point is that since the universe is actually accelerating, it's not decelerating, it's not static, it's not, uh, uh, de or, uh, yeah, it's not decelerating or static, it's actually accelerating, so it can't be zero. Uh, physicists and scientists in general really like nice numbers like one and zero, but a cosmological constant of zero doesn't actually account for the observed phenomenon in the universe. And related to that, the quantum vacuum energy does have observable consequences, and so because of that, we can't dismiss this number as like a, a, a fiction, you know, that's just used theoretically. Um, and the last bit is that it's unambiguously fine-tuned in the sense that if, like we have very rigorous atoms, for example, it's rigorously calculated exactly what the limits are. So we know if we vary this constant past those boundaries, then it's not like you get a universe with different planets. You like get a universe with no chemistry or you get a universe with, that is a black hole. And so that's part of the reason why I think that uh, this, is, this is kind of a real it, it seems to be a real problem. So to answer your question about why I think that this range is this narrow, it seems like the typical players that are used for constricting uh, ranges just aren't there. Um, if I, 
I, I guess my, my question is, you're saying that there's like, we don't have any restrictions to the range that could possibly be, but I'm pretty sure we're still, we're only working with a sample set of one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so why? So, again, like, again, like, mm -hmm. I could agree that all those fields are, have to be within a very, again, mm -hmm. very tiny range, but we don't have another sample set to know that there are, there's the possibility of bounds or the possibility of no bounds. It, we don't have other universes that we can run and go, mm -hmm. oh, so it can fall outside this range. Well, we just have the current universe we have. Well, I, I don't think that's exactly right. Because what, what we're, uh, the question we're dealing with is, um, well, it's all the way back there. But we're dealing with the standard Big Bang model here, which is, a, you know, it's, 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 it's a model of our universe. Um, and we know that the various theories that are included in the standard model, sometime in, sometimes they include restrictions on them uh, that say, you know, because given this theory and given this theory, our universe is not compatible with this other value. I'm trying to think of an example, but unfortunately one's not uh, coming to mind right now. Um, in theory restricts to a finite number of combinations of initial conditions in the universe. Okay, there, yeah, there's, there's one example. But what this is essentially saying is that the values that we're talking about, you know, ranging from uh, the Planck mass, negative Planck mass all the way up to positive Planck mass, um, they're not restricted by relativity, they're not restricted by particle physics. Like, we can vary this constant and nothing else in the theory breaks, which, su which suggests that it's a free parameter that's just measured and it's just stuck in there. It's, there's, nothing that there's no other part of our model that predicts it and there's no other part of our model that's inconsistent with any of these uh, various uh, values, if, if, if that makes sense. How would we, I guess, how would we know the difference then between some factor or some, maybe there's, because our theories of stuff are changing all of the time, and there's, there's a time when it was Newtonian physics rather than general relativity. So how do we know that there's not some other factor at play that we simply just don't know about yet that's like, oh, we, we found this other fact, or we, we've discovered this other, we've integrated this other mm -hmm. theory or this other part of reality into our model, and now it makes perfect sense why this constant is this number that at initially seemed so precise, but actually mm -hmm. just could not be another way, or simply is a result of this other force. Yeah, the, well, so again, I have to rely kind of on experts on this one. Based off of the same thing, like that equation exists because of how perfect this constant is. That, like this hypothetical equation you're talking well, about wouldn't um, work if it wasn't this exact number. I, 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 don't, I, don't, right. I don't think that's, that's uh, exactly right. I, I think the, the bigger issue that, that stands out to me with this is, uh, it would actually be the, where'd it go? Would be the line item five on, that I have up here, that, uh, that Lewis lists here, um, which is that the, the candidates for fixing this problem are like dark energy, for example. Um, and I have to take this purely on authority from, from cosmologists, but apparently every proposed model of uh, dark energy, it doesn't matter what character you pick, it still ends up with having to cancel out uh, all the competing fields to this really narrow slice. Um, so when every, when every piece of observational data uh, and every part of our considerable theory points in the direction that there's nothing really controlling this number, it suggests that it's, it's, a, it's just a free parameter. Now, it could be the case. It is totally possible that some deeper law will explain things in a deeper way, uh, but at least on the evidence that suggests uh, right here, there's, there just isn't anything that's controlling it. Because we currently don't have any current theory as to why or how this might be constrained to this narrow range, it seems that then the assumption is being made that it doesn't have a range to be confined to. Well, that you're, no, so actually the whole point of this argument is that they're trying to choose a range of values right. well, that is so, knowable. Of values, so I, that you're choosing values that can be physically modeled using the best tools that we have at our, at our uh, you know, availability, which is general relativity. And in that range, you can, you can calculate the range of values for this constant that enable a life-permitting right. universe. And there is no 
other, there's no known reason why it should be this value. And so the point is, yes, you can always say, maybe someday we'll find some, something that makes this be, but, but what you're saying right now is that you should ignore the evidence and hope for new evidence in the, in the future that will overturn I, the current I, evidence. I think that's a bit of, that's not quite what I'm attempting to say. I'll, I'll let you go first, Kevin. How do we know that like, if the number was more or less within, uh, within that, outside of that range, those events would happen of the universe crunching back in or nothing? Uh, yeah, so th this is actually um, related to another uh, issue, which is what happens if you vary more than one constant at a time? Because this isn't the only constant that, that's out there. So what's happening is, is actually um, you, uh, you actually just run a simulation. So you have supercomputers in Geneva, for example, that are constantly running simulations of different universes and different events within them based off of the uh, equations of general relativity and other things. So uh, what you do is you essentially punch in a model, start a big bang, keep everything the same, change this one variable, run it up to um, you know, that value that I said there, set that ratio to 10 to the negative 90, uh, and as it turns out, you know, your little computer readout Gravity is too powerful, uh, or it's uh, relative to the strength of gravity, the, cosmo the effect of cosmological constant is too weak to overcome it. So it goes out to a certain point, but then gravity takes over and it brings it back in. It's the same exact equations that let us know like, that our universe is headed for a heat death, uh, ultimately. Um, and it's the same equations that allow us to calculate um, just about all of cosmology, uh, really. Yeah. yeah. So, so, sorry, never mind. Sure. Uh, I, I might want to. I, I might have to truncate the discussion, unfortunately. Right. But we, but yeah. We, but one, we, one we more one more point there. Go go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. uh, I was just to say. I think I think the bit of the confusion here is I'm not I'm not trying to say that there has to be like like there has to be a defining barrier uh, for where the stuff is. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that the fact that we don't I, basically I'm not saying the fact that there is an absence of evidence for there being a specific range that it can exist in, yeah. it seems to me that then y'all are taking, or it's being taken then as, the, the absence of evidence for the range is being taken as evidence for the, uh, is taken as, yeah. The absence of evidence for the range is being mm -hmm. taken as evidence for the absence of a range. Um, I, I think I would disagree with that one. Uh, Cause I think in this case, it's, it's a little bit stronger. It's saying that everything that we know, um, everywhere where we would expect there to be a constraint on this, there isn't a constraint. This is a fine tuning that comes out of knowledge. Like everything that we know about the universe suggests that this is a free parameter. Um, but to the other point, free parameters are often taken as evidence that our theories are incomplete. And free parameters are not necessarily reflective of uh, physical realities. This is certainly the case in the Fung equation in biomechanics. There are like six free parameters and only two of them have a physical meaning, if even that. I, I haven't looked at it in a while. But in this case, the cosmological constant has uh, been under quite a bit of scrutiny um, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. And whenever it's being attacked on, I say attacked, whenever it's being analyzed from multiple fronts and still keeps coming up, it's suggestive to me that it's a, it's a real phenomenon. But in any event, Sadly, I will have to truncate that because I do want to get to some other questions um, and uh, content. So, um, like I said, the cosmological constant is the most popular one. Here are two other ones that are equally controversial, but um, <laughs> I say controversial. Um, so, whenever we talk about the value, expectation value of the Higgs boson, uh, this is another entire other thing. Um, this is also a mass-based uh, uh, value. So, because of that, we can actually set a range um, relative to the Planck mass. And here, our range, instead of 10 to the negative 90, it's 10 to the negative 33rd. Um, there's another value on here called the Yukawa couplings for the up quark, down quark, and electron. Uh, these are a little more wonky because they are dimensionless. So I personally get suspicious when people start talking about the fine tuning of dimensionless parameters. Um, but anyway, Barnes calculates this at uh, a probability of, or sorry, part, uh, a uh, sensitivity of 10 to the negative 13. Um, and again, all of these uh, calculations are found in, you can see his citations in Barnes' uh, article there. It's called A Reasonable Little Question.
So these are just three examples, and these are examples that are in the physics community uncontroversial as far as like there's a there's a fine tuning phenomenon going on here, um, and they're also uncontroversial in that they can be rigorously and principally um, uh, normalized to some physically meaningful range. This is not the case for other things. Um, for example, some people point out that uh, we have three spatial dimensions, but there's it could be infinity. So what's three divided by infinity? Meaningless, yeah, you know. So, so that's why I, li I like these, because they actually have principled ranges uh, set to them. Now, at this point in our conversation, we have to ask this very important question, which is, you've been saying a whole bunch of stuff that you already said as a biomedical engineer, you have absolutely zero reason to believe, uh, or you have zero authority on. So why should I believe you on any of this? Um, so this is a, actually kind of a general good conversation tool if you want to have a conversation about something that's outside of your field of expertise. And the first is consensus. Uh, this is relevant. So the, literally, the overwhelming majority of relevant experts in cosmogony, in astrophysics, they all agree that cosmic fine-tuning is a real phenomenon. And the majority of them do agree on the three cases that we talked about, the, or <laughs> the three we talked about, the three that I mentioned very briefly in passing. Uh, so that to me suggests that there is a real phenomenon to be explained. The second thing is independence. So whenever you look at these uh, people that are talking about fine-tuning, they're, they're not like religious believers that really want the universe to be fine-tuned. Um, a lot of them are atheists. You know, most astrophysicists, I think, are actually atheists. A lot of them are atheists. A lot of them are even neoplatonists. Um, like I mentioned, the Fortunate Universe book is written by an uh, atheist and a Christian. So if you have a different philosophical background, and you're arriving at the same conclusion, that suggests that this is true, independent of any motivated uh, reasoning. Um, the last bit is extravagance, which is people have proposed some really like crazy theories to explain this phenomenon. So what, ir irrespective of what you think about the crazy theories, the fact that people really go to the limits to explain this suggests that it's a real phenomenon. If you have an option of either having you know, a real simple explanation for a phenomenon, um, or sorry, if you have the option of just rejecting a phenomenon, saying this doesn't need to be explained, versus a crazy explanation, you would, it's, it seems to me, just reject the phenomenon. But since so many people go to such great, uh, again, relevant experts go to great lengths to explain this, it suggests it's a real phenomenon, even if you think the explanations are bad. So this is just to say that fine-tuning is, is a real phenomenon. Now, note a caution here. You have to be consistent. So if you use this method for fine tuning, but then jump over to something like you know, climate change or evolution or you know, some other like controversial scientific premise that you disagree with, you gotta be careful if you start going against the general guidelines. Um, that's why, I, at least I try to be clear whenever something I'm saying is like the minority opinion or if it's controversial. Um, because you don't wanna swim upstream uh, against experts, especially if you're not in their field, um, unless you have a really good reason to. So, that's more or less my justification for, for thinking that this is a real phenomenon. Um, so we talked about life. We've talked a little bit about tuning. I hope everyone has at least kind of a loose grasp on this. Um, and so we can talk a little bit about the explanation. So let's talk about explanations for a minute. And let's go back to this crazy equation. So we've seen this before. Uh, this is just a notation for talking about the relationship of evidence and theories, probabilities, and background information. So how probable is some piece of evidence given the conjunction of a theory and the background information. Okay, so let's change gears and I'm gonna ask a question. It's a little, like kind of out of left field here. So what is the probability that your grandmother had a child? 100%. 100%. If she had a child, then I would not be here. I am here, therefore she had a child. Mm -hmm. I would like to offer a counter <laughs> suggestion, which is that the probability that my grandmother had a child is whatever the you know, percentage of women who gave birth versus didn't have any children at that time. Are no, no, it's, it's 100%. That Everybody was the correct the answer. Assumption that <laughs> grandmother, are we running under the assumption that grandmother as a title can be given if you were adopted? No, we're not doing that. This <laughs> is, no. you're way overthinking this. This no, is, no, yeah. Grandmother has to have a child. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
the, yeah, this is supposed to, this is supposed to be the, the Jones example. We're not like, oh, aliens shot the man. That's why the, the fingerprint. No, no, this is this just supposed to be, think about it. What's the probability your grandmother had a child? It's 100%. Now, suppose your grandmother tells you some crazy story about how she met your grandfather and about how, you know, they... Uh, you know, met each other uh, in the 1930s, but then he was deployed off to war and she thought he was dead, but actually his plane managed to land, uh, you know, on, you know, some island in the Pacific and he survived there off of, you know, some crazy story. It doesn't matter how improbable that story is. There's still a 100% chance that she had a child because you're there to hear the story, right? So something's wonky with this, right? Um, and this leads to what's called the weak anthropic principle, because there's a very parallel example with this in the fine-tuning cases. Of course we observe a life-permitting universe. We can't not observe a life-permitting universe any more than we can observe a, our grandmother being barren. Like, it's impossible. You know, our biological grandmother who gave birth to our biological mother, okay, if you want to be really precise there. But it's an impossible observation. So. The weak anthropic principle, um, which is what uh, was popularized by a guy named uh, Brandon Carter, essentially just says we have to be prepared to take account of the fact that our location in the universe is necessarily privileged to the extent of being compatible with the existence, with our existence as observers. So to use the probability notation, the probability of observing a life-permitting universe, given any arbitrary theory, it doesn't matter what the theory is, but if you add in the evidence that it is a life-permitting universe, it's going to be 100%. So what's the probability of a life-permitting universe given God created a life-permitting universe? 100%. What's the probability of a life-permitting universe given uh, a naturalistic uh, life-permitting universe? 100%. So the problem here is how do, we, how do we successfully cut our information out so that it doesn't include, uh, yeah, exactly, that it doesn't become a tautological statement? So here's our example there. It's a, Mm -hmm. in the background information. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, this, yeah, so it's, it's tautological. Um, but some people say that the weak anthropic principle is sufficient to absolve the fine-tuning problem of explanation. But this is actually not necessarily the case. Sometimes, we'll talk about one in a minute, sometimes observational things are sufficient. Uh, this observational selection effect is sufficient um, to get rid of it, the need of an explanation. But in the case of, uh, of the weak anthropic principle, that's not necessarily the case. Here's another example that I think illustrates this point excellently, which is why are the uh, stars that we see, you know, the, the further stars that we see, why are they so bright? Well, the, you know, if they weren't so bright, we wouldn't be able to see them. You know, we don't see planets far away because they don't emit enough light for us, or, uh, emit enough light for us to see them. But saying that star is bright because if it weren't bright, we couldn't see it doesn't answer the question. You have to actually have a rigorous explanation of, you know, um, nuclear fission and all of those types of things. There's still a causal explanation for why the star is bright, but even though you wouldn't be able to see it if it weren't. Um, I'll skip this sharpshooter story for now. That's kind of irrelevant. So let's consider a biblical thought example. Let's go back to the grandmother. I, uh, I was told that we need to include more Bible, so here's me shoehorning it into this example. So in Genesis 18, um, this is incidentally where the grandmother thing came from. Uh, God comes to Abraham and says, I will return to you about this time next year. Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. And so Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And um, the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. and About this time next year, Sarah shall have a son. Now, why does she laugh in this instance? Now, if we include in this, if, now, suppose that Sarah is telling Isaac, her son, this story. Is that really surprising? Like, should she have been surprised that she was going to have a child? Yes. Isaac shouldn't be surprised because he's born, right? So, yeah, exactly. So, what, so how exactly do we understand the, the, um, the evidence, the background information, all that good stuff? So, Here's how we properly scope. So the first thing is that we're not asking what is the probability of Sarah giving birth to a child uh, given that Sarah has given birth to a child. We're asking what is the probability a 90-year-old woman in general gives birth to a child. So 
if we say, you know, if we include the child in the background, it's 100%. But the, what we need to do is take out the evidential claim and get the proper background information. And the proper background information is that women after 40, or whenever they're postmenopausal, roughly on average, the uh, supply of eggs goes down dram uh, dr uh, drastically. Um, it's calculated that at age 40, only about like 30, uh, sorry, 3% of uh, the ovarian reserve is uh, available. And if you extrapolate that out to 90 years old, uh, if this is a natural birth, we can actually rigorously calculate this to be no more than you know, three, to the, uh, three times 10 to the negative 10%, because that's roughly the ovarian reserve of a 90-year-old woman. So what's the probability that she gives birth naturally? That's enormously low. That's why she's surprised. Now, you don't have to be you don't have to know about ovarian reserves and whatnot to realize that. People in ancient times knew 90-year-old women didn't give birth to, to children. It's uh, very rare. But what's the probability that she gives birth to a child, given it's a miraculous birth, given that God is involved? Now things start to get really kind of weird, because now the probability goes up to 100%, which doesn't seem right. So we just say that it's approximately 100%. We say it's way more likely, even if our numbers aren't going to be very rigorous uh, here. Um, and that's the decimal point if you're, wanting, if you're interested in, in what that looks like. So if you consider this example where Sarah, 90-year-old woman, gives birth to a child, what is the probability that that is a miracle versus that that is a natural birth? It's hard to calculate like rigorously, but I think even, even the most hard-pressed uh, person would say that Sarah at 90 years old giving birth to a child is evidential confirmation of a miracle over a natural uh, occurrence. So this is the importance of scoped background information. The background information is not what is the probability Sarah gives birth to a child given she gave birth to Isaac. It's what is the probability that she gives birth to a child given that she's 90 years old and there's no miraculous intervention. Okay, So that's just kind of a thought experiment for thinking through uh, these probabilities. So the point here for our explanation is we have to be very careful about what we include in the background and what we include as evidence. Because if we include our evidence in the background, we end up with wonky, incomprehensible uh, things. So now here's the big uh, payoff, right? So is it the case that this fine tuning of the universe is actually best explained by God? So let's go back to this uh, crazy argument here, the real formal uh, version. So Barnes, uh, his key premise here is the likelihood that a life permitting universe exists on naturalism is vanishingly small. And is it not the case that a life permitting universe exists on theism is vanishingly small? So what's his justification for premise two? Well, this is his justification for premise two, and I'm not going to read it uh, out, but essentially it just says that given naturalism, given, you know, the Richard Dawkins quote that nature doesn't care about you, nature isn't interested in you, there is no reason on earth to think that the subset of possible universes would be biased towards life. There's no reason to think there's a life bias in the natural cosmic lottery because lottery, there's nothing. You know, Nature has no vested interest in, in life whatsoever. Since naturalism is an uninformative theory with respect to the phenomenon of a life permitting universe, it means that we can take those probability distributions from earlier that we calculated and just assume that those are, in fact, the same probability distributions on naturalism. In other words, calculating all the, you know, the, uh, the Higgs VEV, the cosmological constant, uh, Yukawa couplings, et cetera, since we did that under uh, the assumptions of methodological naturalism, we just say, let's assume those assumptions are actually true, and we actually spit out our formal quantified probability of a universe given naturalism. So the long and short of it is you take these numbers, you multiply them together, and you get this big number, which is 10 to 136th. Um, or that's the probability in, in decimal points. Uh, does that mean anything? I'm always skeptical when people start throwing decimal points. But this is just a rough, like really rough calculation. Um, is this vanishingly small? Consider the fact that like the number of atoms in the universe is like 10 to the 80 and this is 10 to the 136. Is this really comprehensible? No, it's not. Our monkey brains can't get numbers these big uh, in between our neurons. But as far as if, if probability calculations are worth anything at all, this is a low number. So in that case, is premise two, the likelihood a life permitting universe exists on naturalism is vanishingly small? Yeah, on naturalism, this is a really surprising piece of information. 
if you don't have some additional premises uh, included in there. But that doesn't tell you much. So, so let's, let's pause for a second and consider this. This is really surprising evidence on naturalism. So it's a really good argument against naturalism. That doesn't by itself make it a good argument for the existence of God. But it does make it good evidential argument um, against naturalism. Like, naturalists have to have something in their worldview that explains this. So why think that theism fares any better? Oh, I forgot to finish this slide. I'm so sorry. Dang it, it looks terrible. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, fine. So Barnes's calculation here, so here, here's what he reasoned. Here's his line of reasoning. When we're dealing with naturalism, we're dealing with essentially a cosmic lottery, just random occurrences. When we're dealing with the hypothesis of theism or a designer, we're talking about an agent with intentionality. Agents with intentionality act out for reasons. They make decisions for reasons. Um, so what he says, what his argument essentially is, let's consider a list of all the possible reasons God, if he exists, Again, because this is our theory we're assuming for a moment. If God exists, what are the possible reasons he could have for creating a life-permitting universe? And suppose that the reason number one on that list is that he wanted to, that he intentionally created the universe for life. Um, and consider that uh, the second reason is God wanted to create a universe with black holes in it. Uh, God wanted to create a universe with just complexity of some kind. You know, no, nothing in particular. Maybe he just set the cosmological constant to a certain value and just said, well, this way it won't collapse in on itself and whatever happens, happens. And wouldn't you know it, life shows up. Um, let's consider reason number four is that um, God uh, is, yeah, just, you know, pick a random reason. So Barnes says, consider all the possible reasons God could have for creating the universe. Do you really think there are 10 to the 136 reasons that God could have for creating the universe? Yes? Is something we don't have to factor, factor in is like, what are the odds that there is a God who did it? Like, does that not factor into the odds? That like, in the same way that naturalism had the odds of everything happening so that life could exist. Yeah. Uh, is it not within the odds of God creating the universe? Do we not have to factor in the odds that there is a God? Uh, well, yeah, that, that's what this is saying. It's saying, consider, consider two theories. The first theory is naturalism, cosmic lottery. We have reason to suspect on naturalism there is no bias towards life. So any universe is equiprobable. So we spread out the probabilities across them. But if theism is true, is there a reason to think that on theism, assuming God exists, is there a reason to think God would be biased towards creating a universe with life? And Barnes says that is essentially impossible to calculate. But as a like, rough back-of-the-envelope uh, assumption, you know, approximation, he says, if you think that God has fewer than 10 to the 136 reasons for creating the universe, if that list is smaller than that, that is sufficient for an evidential bump. But I feel like we're saying that like, if God exists, you're kind of jumping over a lot. Like, it's almost like going back to the weak anthropic principle of like, yeah. it's almost like saying, under this principle, there is 100% odds that there is a God. I feel like that's jumping over the odds of what are the odds that a God exists and, like, could a God exist? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, yeah. So you're saying, like, okay, what is the probability that a married bachelor created the universe? Well, a married bachelor is impossible, right? So it's not even worth considering. Yeah, or what if, what is the probability the universe created itself? Well, that's also incomprehensible, right? So, um... The, you're right. So this is assuming that the concept of God is internally coherent, um, which is something that you know I, I, I skipped over uh, just for the sake of time. But um, if you're interested in this, the um, there's a guy named Richard Swinburne that has like a, a uh, that's part of his project. Um, he's a Bayesian, like so he follows Bayes theory. He uses it for everything. But the very first step in doing a full Bayesian analysis. This is just a restricted one. Uh, Swinburne is, is his name. Uh, S-W-I-N-B-U-R-N-E. Uh, Richard Swinburne. Um, and so he has, uh, the, the first part of his project was establishing what is the prior probability of God existing. Not conditional on any evidence, just what is the bare prior probability. Um, and part of that is, is God a coherent concept? 
So the first book he ever wrote in like 1970 something was called The Coherence of Theism. And the thesis is the three omni properties. God is omniscient, God is all powerful, uh, God is uh, omnipresent, God is all knowing, God is all good. I think I might have repeated one. All of those things are internally coherent. Therefore, the idea of God is an internally coherent concept. Maybe false, but it's internally coherent. So this is assuming, it's very astute actually, that this argument is assuming that naturalism and theism are both internally coherent theories that um, make some type of predictions. Now there are some that argue naturalism isn't an internally consistent theory. There are some that argue theism is not internally consistent. But here we're just saying, let's assume both of these are internally consistent. So if you consider um, what Barnes's argument is saying is that uh, when you have an agent with intentionality, instead of having you know, probability, like random probabilities, as we have on the naturalist case, you have to essentially discern what the motive of the agent is. Right. So, so you can... Not the God. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you're saying if God exists, let, let's, let's, assume, let's assume God exists, what's the probability that he would create a universe that is right. like the one that we observe? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I'm so, glad that you mentioned that guy because that makes a lot of sense for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so it, like plugging it, in theism was a little too easy. Mm -hmm. makes sense yeah, to yeah, me. exactly. So in the, it, you can also consider this more like the, um, you know, if you go to the, like the robbery example, that's usually what's involved there. Or sorry, I guess the murder example. They usually look for motive among all those things. So and sometimes they exclude candidates because they say you know, Jones has fingerprints on the gun, and he was also uh, uh, a business partner of Craig's, and Craig ended up cutting him out of some stock deals or something. Well, now, what's the probability that, see, now you're actually thinking, what is the probability that Jones killed Craig because he stabbed him in the back uh, business-wise? And you think, that probability is probably a lot higher than any other reason that Jones has. So that's the thinking that's going on with, uh, what Barnes is saying with, with theism. Because if you think about, let's stick with the murder example for a minute. Jones could have killed Craig for any number of reasons, right? Let's assume they were business partners and something went foul, all right, and, and like ruined Jones' life. Let's, let's say that's one reason. Now the question here is, um, you could also say Jones is a psychopath and just likes killing people at random. You could say that uh, Jones uh, accidentally fired the gun you know, that you just did that. Um, you could say that Jones tried to kill somebody else, but uh, in a case of mistaken identity, killed Craig instead. And you can come up with a long list of all these reasons. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, does that reason carry enough weight to make you think that, is the overall theory, Jones killed Craig because uh, Craig stabbed, his, stabbed him in the back uh, with a business deal. Is that the best explanation? Is that better than Jones's fingerprints randomly appeared on the firearm? Yeah, you know, because you can concoct a, a ton of logically compatible scenarios, but the question is which one is the most probable out of all of those? And so what Barnes is asking us to think is, on this case, if we consider the theistic hypothesis, if we consider that God exists, would his reason be create a universe with life? Or would his reason be create a universe with black holes? or would his, you know, et cetera, create a long list of all these things. And he says, if that list is shorter than 10 to the 136 reasons, then fine-tuning, well, it's not necessarily more likely, but fine-tuning provides an evidential bump than that. So you can consider, the best way to think about it is, how many scenarios are possible on each of these lists? And whichever list is the shortest is the one that wins. That's and you can do that with the Jones case, you can do that with the God case, the naturalist case. Um, the, the problem here is that on, uh, the argument goes that on naturalism, you have at least 10 to the 136 universes, of which only one is a life permitting universe, because um, it's non-informative. Whereas on the God case, you have reason to suspect that that list of universes is gonna be biased towards life permitting ones, so it makes it more likely. Whoops, that wasn't the right button. There we go. Okay. To, to some extent, isn't there a concern here that you might be um, importing some uh, 
importing some of your theory into the background information here, right? Because I was going to ask the same question. So going back to the Jones example, the background information included that Jones had uh, been excluded from mm -hmm. the bank's business deal. Yeah, exactly. Do, so, yeah, so th this is a really good point. So do you have a reason to expand your background information? Sometimes there, there is good. About God in I'm, our background information. Um, in the background information, is there anything about God? Well, I mean, you would include like the definition of God, I would think. In, in the that. definition of God is a loving God who, in the Bible, chose to. Well, you don't want to. You want to. You don't want to include in the Bible. We're not talking Christian yet. We're just talking God. So uh, I guess my my issue is to think about it this way. Okay. So the question is, why is there a life permitting universe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so given that there's a life permitting universe, because we are living creatures, you know. So let's you know throw out that alternative hypothesis that God is. A creation of living creatures that couldn't exist without there being a life permitting universe. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't those creatures think of God in such a way that that God would prefer to create living creatures? Mm. So, in a sense, when you're trying to do that div divine psychology on God, would God prefer a, a, a life permitting universe? Might you be importing some of those like you're importing the, the mm -hmm. fact that you were in a life permitting universe into what it means for God for there to be yeah. God. Yeah, so th this is a good point. So um, the, the simplest answer to this is that theism was advocated prior to the fine tuning discovery which is a really when you're doing theory uh, comparison is a really uh, good point. So um, if you have these, uh, if you have theism which is developed, you know, you've got to consider the fact that Aquinas, for example, probably has the most sophisticated account of God, what God is, what his intentions are, et cetera, et cetera. And he uh, lived and died, you know, centuries before any of the fine tuning discoveries. So we're actually just taking this theory that was developed way before any of this discovery and then saying, does the new evidence actually make this theory more likely or less likely? Uh, and the fact that it's not postulated to explain the fine-tuning does give it an evidential bump in that case. Uh, I, I don't know if that was directly relevant to what you were saying, though. So. We have a question from the chat. Oh. It um, says, oh. Uh, how does the prior probability part compare with evaluating miracles resurrection? Given a prior probability of God near zero, a supernatural explanation of some data is unlikely. Is that the same here? If the prior probability of God is low, it may be that theism is better than naturalism, but still not a viable explanation. This is a really good question. So what this argument, as I've crafted it out here, and as it was on this slide, all this argument is saying is the fine-tuning evidence provides an evidential bump uh, to theism. That's all that this argument is claiming. So um, it doesn't even conclude that theism is true. It just says that this fine-tuning evidence is favorable, more favorable to theism than it is to naturalism. Uh, and so in that case, you can, you can actually use this evidence to update your prior probability to um, a higher posterior probability. So when you talk about like the resurrection, for example, um, if you don't think God exists and you think the prior probability of God is zero, then no possible evidence could ever you know, uncover, uncover that. Um, but if you have a case where uh, you look at this evidence, and it turns out that um, you're not actually using, in, in this case, there is an, ex an evidential bump, then maybe it gets you from zero to like, you know, 0.25 or something like that. In which case, any more evidence you include is going to increase the probability higher and higher um, in that case. So that's, that's really all this is saying. It's, it's pretty restricted, if, if that makes sense. Let's see here. So interestingly, I haven't actually got to the multiverse scenario, which is kind of interesting, I think. Um, anyway, are any other uh, comments real quick? I, I have a couple, of uh, a couple of other objections I wanted to get to pretty quickly. But I did want to make one final point on the divine psychology uh, issue, which is when you're making this list of reasons why God might make the universe, if you take a step back and consider other parts of natural theology, you might be running into a problem with the problem of evil. 
So there is a branch of natural theology which aims to uh, answer the question, why does God allow evil, with the answer, God is so far above our comprehension, we couldn't possibly expect to answer that question. In fact, we couldn't possibly expect to have a, a grasp on any of God's reasons, evil or otherwise. So because of that, to, um, to bring this section kind of to, to a point, uh, there are some theists who would say, if you take the fine-tuning argument, you take the problem of evil, they cancel out. Because you have this thing that's highly unlikely on naturalism, fine-tuning, you have something highly unlikely on theism, evil, they both have an inscrutable element to them, they cancel out. So even if you don't think it's a good ag argument for the existence of God, it may actually be an evidential uh, defeater for the problem of evil. So I think that's one interesting application. But uh, that's if we just, that's if we take sort of the low road, I would say. That's the most reserved position um, for, for this argument, which is just to say it's an argument against naturalism and uh, it provides evidential counterbalance to the problem of evil. But can we actually go further and say this is actually a good argument for the existence of God? Um, and I think it would be relevant to consider some atheists that have looked at this argument and what they think. One thing I think is interesting is that uh, Christopher Hitchens said this was his favorite uh, argument, says that um, all of us, you know, leading atheists, consider the fine-tuning argument to be the most intriguing. Um, it's not trivial. You can't just dismiss it um, easily. Uh, one of the most prompt, and, and to great consternation 10 years ago, uh, one of the foremost uh, atheists of the 20th century, Antony Flew, converted to deism, not Christianity, deism, because of this argument. Um, which I think is kind of kind of funny. Uh, it made a lot of people really mad because uh, he did this like right before he died too. Um, so he wasn't around to hear people complain about it. Um, but I think my favorite, my absolute favorite take on this argument is from Sean Carroll, who is by far one of my favorite atheists. Uh, <laughs> Pen, Pen Gillette's still number one, but Sean Carroll, he's one of my favorites. So this was in a debate he had uh, on, on this argument. And he says, the teleological argument from fine tuning. I am very happy to admit right off the bat, this is the best argument that the theists have, especially when it comes to cosmology. That's because it plays by the rules. You have phenomena, you have parameters of particle physics and cosmology, and you have two different models, theism and naturalism. And you want to compare which model is the best fit for the data. I applaud that general approach. Given that, it's still a terrible argument and not at all convincing. I think that's probably the best take. Even if you don't find it convincing, at least it plays by the rules. Uh, in, in any event, he actually doesn't think there is a fine-tuning problem at all, um, but he's, he's got some interesting thoughts on it. So um, in any event, let's look at some quick objections real quick. Um, there are two that I kind of want to talk about real quick, and then we'll uh, pivot back to the discussion, because I think we had some good, good questions going on there. The first one is that a lot of people think that if you look at the universe as massive as it is, you know, it's like 30 billion light years across, um, why think that this tiny, insignificant, little pale blue dot that we live on, why think the universe is fine-tuned for that? Um, so the answer to this is just to say, th this is an example of where that selection effect is actually relevant. Because as we talked about with the cosmological constant, the universe is undergoing expansion. So to say that the universe is big is really just to say that the universe is old. It's been constantly expanding for a really long time. Um, and as it turns out, the amount of time that it takes to generate the chemicals um, and elements that are necessary for biochemistry take a really long time to make. Um, as Carl Sagan said, you know, to also quote him, you need an entire universe to make something as simple as an apple pie. Because you have to think about this. For those of you that are biochemistry majors or whatnot, you know, uh, the, uh, the acronym is SCHNAPS. That's basically all of life, you know carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. But just to make carbon, which is of course the most significant element, you have to go through a very, very long process. Um, in particular, you have to go through the entire birth and death of a star. Almost no carbon was generated during the Big Bang, which means that almost all carbon in the universe, and definitely almost all carbon on Earth, was generated by what's called the triple alpha process which um, essentially is whenever helium is forged in the core of a star. Long story, I mean, to super simplify it, you have a whole bunch of uh, hydrogen that's in a star. It's compressed really tightly. You got two hydrogen atoms, they compress together. Now you've got helium. And then you get another hydrogen atom, boom, you got beryllium. 
get another hydrogen atom, boom, you get carbon. And now that carbon is in the core of a star. Now that keeps going for a really long process and you keep going up the periodic table until eventually the star gets to be, uh, uh, it exits its main sequence and it becomes either too big or too small or too dense. It collapses in on itself. It explodes into a supernova. The supernova remnant scatters all of those heavy elements across the universe. That those elements eventually become you and me. So whenever people say you're made of stardust, that's what they're talking about. So this process right here, for an average star like our sun, takes like 10 billion years just to get through this process. So the minimum size of a universe where carbon uh, life is expected, to, or where carbon-based life is present, the minimum age is going to be like 10 billion years. Thus, the minimum size is going to be like 10 billion light years. So the fact that our universe is 14-ish billion is really not that surprising. This is something I've never really found that persuasive, that the universe is big. It's big because it's old. The other part is actually the exact inverse, which is uh, that you're claiming that life is delicate. You know, it's this delicate thing. You change one thing over here, life falls apart. Um, but if there's one thing that the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. It breaks free. It expands to new territories. It crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but uh, life finds a way. Jurassic Park is the reference. Um, this is the inverse, which says that, you know, you're saying that this is fine-tuned for life. You know, we're really, really small. This one's saying, how can life be delicate if it survives in all these uh, crazy uh, conditions? And it's very true. Here on Earth, there are what are called extremophiles, which exist at incredible temperatures and pressures and chemical compositions. But the fine-tuning that we're talking about is, is there chemistry? We're not talking about like changing pressures or changing concentrations of phosphorus. We're saying things like, is there anything more than hydrogen? Um, and so it's very difficult to find a way for life uh, to proceed if all you have is hydrogen and you have literally zero chemical interaction beyond maybe an occasional helium uh, formation. So these are arguments that they just don't appreciate what fine tuning really is um, and what the claims really are. These are saying that uh, the universe is fine tuned for even the preconditions of life, not even life itself. Um, so here's another one. This actually kind of goes back to Caleb's earlier point, which is we have a single universe that we inhabit. So how many universes have we observed? One. How many have life in them? One. So there's your probability. One out of one universes. So yeah, so how do we, how do we get past this point? If all the universes that we've observed are life permitting, then how do we get around this? Um, and essentially, this, uh, the, the comparison range that we're talking about is not observed universes, but rather, these are theoretical physicists, right? So we're talking about theoretical universes that we generate on the basis of equations and whatnot. So insofar as you think those equations are accurate at explaining our universe and are accurate at predicting what would happen if things were different, then um, that's the ratio that you're comparing to. Um, but just for the last five minutes, just to get through the, the last little bit in Tai Bo, the leading alternative theory to theism um, is actually a multiverse scenario. So um, this is actually where I expected most of the conversation to be. So I have like a thousand slides on this, but we'll go quickly. Basically, the, 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 the central idea is just this. If you have um, some strange phenomenon, like fine tuning, or even like survivability, uh, you can explain that by multiplying probabilities and then adding a selection effect. So there, the reason we observe a life permitting universe is because there are many, 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 many universes, incomprehensibly many, that are generated by some multiverse generator, uh, and the generator randomly assigns these values, you know, cosmological constants, Higgs values, et cetera. They're very similar to our universe, but those values are different. So naturally, if that is the case, and there are all of these multiverses, or sorry, if there are all these multiple universes, of course we're going to observe the one that we live in. Um, I'll just be real quick about this. The standard problems with this is that it, this might not actually be a scientific alternative. It may just be like a naturalistic metaphysical postulate. Um, and probably more importantly, it doesn't actually solve the, it's, it's not obvious that it solves the fine tuning problem. Because in order to have a generator for the multiverse, you have to have certain parameters that generate the different universes, and those themselves, in the multiverse models that have been suggested, have their own free parameters that pop up. And so if you keep having free parameters all the way down, 
you're not actually arriving at a better explanation. You're just moving that explanation further up the chain. Um, the other problem, which I think is probably, at least for the popular level, like multiverse scenario, um, and I, I don't say that like, oh, I'm a cosmologist, you know, so I don't deal with the popular level. I just mean that there are formal ways of dealing with this problem, but for people that just say, well, the reason that this improbable event happened is because there are a bunch of trials, that unrestricted sense of the multiverse uh, leads to some very uncomfortable problems uh, probabilistically, such as the measure problem. When you have something improbable that occurs and you multiply your uh, occurrences to infinity just to cover that one probability, you also cover every single other probability. So even if you have a low probability event that comes up, it's going to come up somewhere in the multiverse. How do you know it's not this uh, particular universe? So now your probabilistic reasoning gets uh, falls uh, falls apart. Um, and then also there are a di oh, yeah. That said, you can no longer do any probabilistic. Well, yeah, exactly. So. Some versions, yes. So many times that, like, it, it, so, very instance, small wow. chance means nothing. In one universe, there is a matrix that exists. Ooh, yeah, we should not in the be matrix. surprised by any exactly. feature of the yes. universe which we observe. Yes. So if we're playing poker and I deal five royal flushes in a row, <laughs> ah, it's got to happen somewhere in and the you multiverse. Have a hand with yeah. And importantly, that doesn't show that the universe, the multiverse, doesn't exist. It just means that if the multiverse does exist, we have to stop using any probabilistic reasoning. Right. And it, well, if this is an argument for the for the multiverse. Yeah, exactly. And and to be and to be fair, there are there is no the multiverse. There are multiple models that are that are proposed, um, and one particular unrestricted version falls into that trap. Um, and then lastly, there are additional fine tuning data that can be included that um, the multiverse doesn't account for. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but of course, if you read uh, Barnes's book, uh, The Fortunate Universe, they actually talk about these in detail. So Grant Lewis, the author, um, the atheist author, he actually opts for the multiverse explanation. So at the very end of the book, he and Luke have like a conversation about it, and they talk about these particular uh, issues. Um, I'll just go through really quickly on this. Uh, these are, for example, here are four conditions multiverses have to uh, fit each one of these. In every proposed model, from what I can tell, they all have free parameters that come up. Um, dang it, didn't get to the didn't get to the Boltzmann brains today. Um, there, uh, here's one example of what I mean by uh, the multiverse uh, not accounting for certain fine tuning data. So, for example, uh, the fine structure constant is something that is important um, when it comes to energy conversion uh, in our universe. It happens to have a value of 1 over 1 to the 37th. If you make it too small, um, and it's like by 10 to 40 percent, so it's not like the incomprehensible numbers. You know, they're, it's, it's much less fine-tuned. But like, if you make it too small, then uh, biomass fires um, consume too much energy, and they never go out because they never exude enough energy to go out. So you end up with a universe exactly like ours, except every match strike ends with a forest fire because there's just an unending amount of fire everywhere. Um, also, interestingly, microscopes are no longer able to resolve uh, at the 0.2 microns. Um, so all of cellular biology falls apart because you have to do all your imaging by scanning electron microscopy, which is not compatible with uh, uh, living cells. You have to kill your cells in order to do that. On the other hand, if you make this structure too big, um, then fire never gets invented and civilization never gets invented. So you can have a multiverse, but the question is, now you have to answer this question, why in the multiverse are we in the cool multiverse where there are like cars and civilization and not? If there is a restricted model yeah. of the multiverse, then that's a trans multiverse fine example of fine tuning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, there's a nearby universe that's like Anprim world where they never create fire because fire is impossible and they just live as cavemen and it's beautiful. Here's yeah. a bit of an interesting question for this one. And this is, I mean, just, it's very, this one's a little bit quicker. How do we know we're not in one of those universes where we got unlucky, where maybe, maybe there's some other factor that is slightly off, and so we don't have the ability to do something else that's like really crazy? Yeah, so th this is where you have to get into the particular cases. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this, this is one where you, um, the cases here, so this particular example is a lot newer. So let, let, let me just, talk a little bit about the scholarship and why I'm more confident in the anthropic examples. The cosmological constant was 
uh, that fine tuning was first discussed in 1974, which was like, what, 45 years ago, 47 years ago now? Um, and it has, like, it's still a problem in cosmology. This particular example was first proposed in 2014. I am not totally convinced this is going to hold up to scrutiny. It may actually not be an actual phenomenon. Uh, but there are some others that uh, can be discussed. And like I said, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip over them. But if you're interested in that, the guy's name is Robin Collins. Uh, I have the thing down here. Um, and the argument is the fine-tuning for discoverability So uh, for that one. But the point of it is it's additional data that's not predicted by multiverse scenarios. That's us. That's where we live. We live in fire world. Happy fire world. Um, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll skip through this real quick. Okay, here's, but here's the, uh, here's the point of it all. So here's the main conclusion that I wanted to get to really quickly, which is the fine-tuning of the universe, if it has an explanation, which I definitely think it does, um, essentially points you either in the direction of theism or in the direction of a multiverse or in the direction of God created a multiverse. Those are essentially your three conclusions from this. All of those are like super crazy and wild, and I think they're very interesting, no matter w whichever one comes up. Um, and so for that reason, I think this argument is intrinsically interesting, even if you don't necessarily agree with the theistic argument. Now, I think that there are problems with the multiverse that make it less favorable than theism, but for consistency, the multiverse is compatible with theism. Um, and if the multiverse and, uh, uh, you know, if, if that's a sufficient explanation for anthropic fine-tuning, you know, it, so much the worse for the design argument, right? Um, but that's, that's the progress of science, if that's actually the case. But as it stands now, I think that the multiverse is probably not, the, at least the general attitude in cosmology is it's pretty much split down the middle. Most people, half of cosmologists are like, yeah, this might work. Half of them say, probably not. So I think that's interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much. I did not intend to go this long, uh, but in any event, um, sorry about that. So thank you so much for, for being here, and I'll stick around um, for as long as I want. <laughs>